I'm Ilri, scientist and bioscience communications manager. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like um, to, to, to share a couple of things uh, to our panelists. Um, please ensure that you are able to switch on your video. Um, IT should be able to help us with this <laughs> in order to have a roundtable discussion. Um, and I'd also like to encourage all of you online to please insert your questions to the chat functions for our panelists. So can we all confirm with a thumbs up that we're able to switch on our videos? Great. Thank you. Okay. So... <clears throat> Earlier this morning, we heard our DG share the definition of One Health, which is in line with uh, the Tripartite Plus. But we've also heard that this space is large. And depending on who you speak to, you know, the perspectives can vary. Uh, today, we aim to speak with experts who can share their insights um, on this subject. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, and we'll get them pinned so you can all see them. Um, Eleanor Opondo who's a professor at the Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Uh, welcome, Eleanor. Uh, Jeanette Dower, who's a medical epidemiologist at Washington State University. Salome Bukachi, associate professor at the University of Nairobi's Institute of Anthropology. Jason Sersoli, e ecosystems ecologist here at Ilri, Nairobi. And Eric Fev, a professor of veterinary infectious disease and global health from the University of Liverpool and jointly appointed scientist at ILRI. Welcome to all of you. In order to kick off uh, this session, I'd like to ask all of you um, a question. What does One Health mean to you in the context of work that you do? Uh, we're going to start with Eleanor, Jeanette, Salome, Eric, and Jason. Thank you. All right. Um, so just to give you a, um, a bit of background on what I do, my background is medicine, clinical epidemiology, and evidence-based healthcare. And my work typically revolves around researching evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based policy. So I'm pretty much into the health sector. I'm not really a One Health specialist, but they are very there are very clear um, similar principles with the transdisciplinary approach. One Health is our transdisciplinary um, area. The same thing with evidence-based healthcare. Nowadays, when, when it comes to making decisions at both the international and national level, there's a request for integrated information to make decisions. Evidence about qualitative research, quantitative research, cost-effectiveness from various sectors. So I would say those are the similarities, a transdisciplinary approach in my work and similarities with One Health. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, Jeanette, over to you. Uh, thanks, Hector. So in my line of work, um, which is um, research on zoonosis, uh, my emphasis would be when we look at a zoonosis, we're looking at the human health aspect as well as the animal health aspect. Um, there's the question about, you know, vector-borne diseases. Um, it's something we want to look into. Uh, when it comes to the environment, climate change is something we also want to look into. So when it comes to One Health research, I would say in my day-to-day, -day, it's about humans and animals, but understanding that there's more to it but the capacity to address all of it is a bit of a challenge. There's something Elena um, mentioned, you know, she mentioned that she's, she's not really a One Health person, but if we have a One Health outlook, I think all of us are supposed to be One Health practitioners, but then understanding what our role is as a One Health practitioner, it's something that I agree with Elena sometimes, it's not too clear uh, what it should be. Thank you. Salome, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Hector. Uh, so I'm a medical anthropologist, and my work involves um, looking at human behavior and how that impacts on various uh, developmental issues. So um, I've specialized in uh, medical anthropology in relation to infectious and zoonotic diseases. So my work has involved um, an in uh, interface or the integration between the various disciplines to be able to solve a particular disease, uh, have worked together with veterinarians, medical um, doctors, um, entomologists, ecologists, to try and uh, find a solution 
to a specific problem. Initially, it started as multidisciplinary, but increasingly it's becoming transdisciplinary where it's not just about each component coming in to do their bit, but all of us weaving whatever we are doing together and coming up with a common holistic solution. Thank you. Thank you, Salome. Um, Jason? Thanks, Ekta. Uh, I, so I'm an ecologist and a conservation biologist. At this time, I mostly work in communal grazing lands, helping, uh, helping to improve management of those lands, mostly through combined institutional strengthening, along with improving the, the technical capacity of those, those institutions to manage grazing lands. And so I see One Health and specifically the control of especially animal disease and zoonoses, parasites, as a way of adding value to the uh, rangeland management approaches that we use. Uh, and so I, I, think it's a, I think it's a very significant area and we're still developing approaches where we can improve rangeland health at the same time that we are also improving the health of animals. Uh, and so, but this is a very, this is a very new area. Uh, and uh, we, but we see quite a few opportunities and, um, and I should also note that in uh, pastoralist rangelands, there is the uh, very significant uh, fact that the health of the ecosystem is linked uh, very directly to the health of, of livestock and also to food security and nutritional security in these areas where milk is the, is the, main, uh, is the, is the main source of nutrition and food. Uh, as well as well as for livelihoods, economically speaking, that's most of the income in these areas, and so uh, it's it's quite uh, it's it's quite direct links that you have in pastoral systems, which you might not have otherwise. Where environmental health, which is different from ecosystem health, let's we have to separate those two. Environmental health is a public health concept. Ecosystem health is an ecological concept. The health of the ecosystem itself, whereas environmental health is everything that affects the health of people from the environment. And so, but in the case of pastoralist rangelands, the, uh, the, the fact that the health of the ecosystem links to the health of people is, is, is quite significant and different from, from most farming and other ecosystems where human health is tangentially or indirectly related to the health of a forest or a cropping system. There are times when there are direct links, but uh, generally not. It's generally not as direct. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Eric, over to you. Thank you, Ekta. Uh, well, and hello, everybody. Um, I guess what I would say is that uh, I, I'm very much in line with the definition that was presented this morning, which is really that it's about integrating. Um, it's an integrative approach that brings together the humans, animals, and, and, and the environment in the context of the health of each of those different components. So it's about the health of humans in the context of the health of animals and of the environment in which they live. It's the health of animals in the context of the humans who keep them or who live, share an environment with them. And it's the health of the environment that those animals and that those people use um, and how those different components impact and, and affect each other. And this at multiple spatial scales. So for me, the scale is really important. It can apply within a household. It's an approach that can apply at the scale of a village, of a community, of a county or a whole country. Or And then, of course, we go to an international scale. It gets much harder to conceptualize the multitude of linkages at, at that much more international scale. But for me, the, the key thing is that this approach requires us to think in an integrated uh, and coherent way, which means disciplines need to communicate with each other. And really crucially, and we heard this from George in his uh, keynote speech this morning, that so someone asked him uh, whether you know, he drifted away from his, his disciplinary roots. And he said, no, he still has his disciplinary root. And I think that's really important that it's not about becoming a generalist. It's about be remaining a specialist, but putting your specialism in the context of everybody else's specialism and allowing your specialism to evolve and to be influenced by 
the specialist thinking and approaches of other people. Thanks. Eric, before we move away from you, but in terms of specific work that you do, are you able to share where you use One Health approaches? So uh, thank you for that. Um, the, the the example I would choose is 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 a, a study that we uh, is a series of studies that, that we've conducted, where the unit of interest is let's say a household nested within a series of uh, villages, and within those households we're interested not just in human health or indicators of human wealth or animal health and indicators of animal health, but absolutely the relationship between what's going on in the animals and mechanistically how that impacts on, on the health and well-being of the people in those households. And though the transmission of the diseases that we, we were concerned with in that program influenced very heavily by the environment in which those people live. So everything coming together, we have to measure in the science that we do, we're measuring something at a particular unit. And in that particular context, we chose the unit of the household, but those households are emblematic of relationships that are within themselves, within and and within broader geographical scales. Yeah, Eric, thank you so much. Um, I think over to Nicholas to 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 get to Menti because we've heard some very broad um, perspectives, and we'd like to hear from you online as well um, on what you think. Uh, One Health uh, means to you and sort of the context uh, applied. Nick? Thanks, Hector. Let's, let's get the questions up. We are getting the questions up online so that you can engage the audience. So while we're waiting for Menti to, to pick up, um, anyone in the pa uh, panelists, please, um, how do you often apply One Health approach in your daily work? Okay, I will answer that. Uh, so... One health approaches, though initially I said I'm not a one health specialist, I just thought of an example of my recent work that where we um, attempted to use the one health approach. Uh, we were tasked to provide evidence for the ministry to make recommendations. And um, we had to look at um, data, synthesize information, look at existing systematic reviews. And this was about COVID. Um, so, um, pretty much the studies that we looked at, some of them included uh, human beings, others were animals. But then so synthesizing that was easy on our part. But then the challenge that we had was uh, in communicating the evidence. The, the panelists were more inter interested in the information about uh, the human beings. So I couldn't fault them uh, because I think it was more a comfort zone. That is their area of speciality. So that is a, a classic example of where I was using a One Health approach, but then it was very challenging to communicate that integrated approach to the decision makers who had to make a decision to inform a policy. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, Nick, are we ready or do you need a few more minutes? Sure. Uh, in that case, Eric, um, we have a question from uh, Martin Wainaina who asks, how do universities train One Health approaches? And is, are there some universities with courses in One Health? Um, is this more effective or is it better if we were to have uh, course units in the different disciplines that may be involved? Thank you. Well, there, there's several people here in the room who've undertaken courses in One Health who may be better uh, uh, able to answer that than, than me. But I think, yes, the, the, the courses that teach One Health teach people to think integratively um, while building on their skills. So One Health courses, I, I would say, tend to be at master's level when people already have a, a, a basic uh, grounding in a particular discipline. And I think that's very appropriate. As I said before, we can't all be generalists. We have to be specialists, but then apply our specialisms in ways that that uh, that that allow us to be more general with them rather than just be generalists. In which case, we we don't have that much to offer. So, um, th those those courses in One Health teach people to take their specialist skills, to learn from a, a range of other skills. For example, a biologist learning from somebody like like Salome about the way people think about their livestock or their own health, and use that knowledge. To, to guide the work that they do in their own specialist discipline. Thank you, Eric. Um, Nick, are we ready to go into Menti now? 
Okay. So if you please answer the question that you have. So the audience, this is the response from the audience. They're saying that some say they're using One Health in terms for education, community education, others in research, some in outbreak investigation, for surveillance, especially for zoonotic diseases. There we go. I think everyone can see the screen now. So a lot of people are saying in research. Nick? So most One Health, we can see mostly has been taken up at the research level. Some at the control still, we're seeing that a lot has been coming through, especially for zoonotic diseases. And remember, we were saying that we don't need to narrow One Health into only zoonosis. But also, let's see what, what's coming in. Again, community, education, and disease risk, disease modeling, disease management and control, project appraisal, and research. Yeah, some, one of the veterinarians online is saying that they control disease at the animal level, especially for pets, like rabies, anthrax again. So, yeah, controlling disease spillover. So that's interesting because, um, thank you, Nick. Um, what's interesting is that it's all sort of very much so linked with uh, zoonotic diseases and spillover, um, which brings me to uh, back to our panelists. I'd like to start with Eleanor and then to Jason. Um, Eleanor, starting with you, what are some of the challenges uh, that you are facing on applying One Health approaches? Um, all right. So in my work in research and evidence-based healthcare, we typically look at systematic reviews, uh, look at or conduct systematic reviews. One common denominator, at least of all the reviews that are involved in or reviewed or seen other groups um, conduct, is that when it comes to including studies, many authors tend to exclude studies done on animals or rather exclude animal studies. So there you can see there's a beginning a disconnect of the information people are keen on, even on infectious diseases, some zoonotic diseases. Typically, most authors will uh, include studies conducted in human beings. And there are also um, such strategies and filters that can exclude animal studies. So when it comes now to actually not interpreting that data with animal studies excluded, that can be a challenge. So that is one aspect. And then, as I mentioned, um, the recent work my team did on COVID-19 COVID to inform policy on COVID-19, we came across studies that um, reviews that had included animal studies, but then in communicating that evidence to decision makers at the panel, the panelists were more keen on studies that involved um, um, human beings. So again, there's a challenge um, in that disconnect, in that people have preference for human studies, but I guess it's more about the audience, people who commission the reviews, conduct the reviews. It's more about the area that they are more uh, comfortable in. So perhaps now integrated approaches should be more talked about. And I can talk about a current project that I'm involved in, where we are tasked to develop an integrative approach to evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based decision-making. Because right now you can't really make decisions on just one aspect of health. There are so many players that you have to consider. Um, so recently, again, another project based, was based on an integrative approach, but that was on other aspects of health, different aspects of health. Animal studies were not included in that integrative approach. So from these discussions, I'm beginning to see the importance of also including animal studies in that integrative approach not just thinking of the integrative approach when it pertains to human studies. But again, methodologies for that are still upcoming. There's some people who have conducted systematic reviews on animal studies, but again, I've been in presentations where when people are trying to present those studies, uh, the audience are more of, okay, what are the methods? Um, how do we synthesize information for human beings and animal studies? What are the implications? So still, yes, some people are appreciating One Health, but many people still find a challenge in connecting um, or understanding this integrative approach, especially when it comes to not crossing the line between animal and human studies. That's really interesting, Eleanor. Um, Jason, over to you for some thoughts. Well, I think, I think the main value of the One Health concept and approach is 
is an action. Um, and sure, and sure, research is needed in order to develop those actions. But I think uh, that that's really where its main value is: is where uh, a, you have actions that are addressing the environment, uh, addressing animal health, addressing human health directly in each case, but in an integrated, uh, an overall integrated strategy. And, and that's that's where you that's where I see One Health having big impacts in the real world. Um, and so I think I think the the biggest challenge, uh, as as some of the other panelists ha have mentioned, is moving from being multidisciplinary to being transdisciplinary, and really really working together in an in integrative fashion, which is very very difficult uh, because all of you are speaking different languages. You all have different knowledge sets. Even the questions that you're interested in are generally different, uh, and uh, and so I think uh, it, it's that challenge means you need you need more to pay more attention in especially project planning, uh, developing the questions. It has to be from the beginning, and if it's if it's not if it's not from the outset, then you're you're kind of piecing it together in a haphazard fashion. Uh, you know, a patchwork as as you go, and so it's not it's not easy to take that time and 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 develop uh, truly integrative research. Uh, but that is where the strongest impact will, will come from. And I think uh, working in that transdisciplinary space it means everyone has to take others others' experience seriously. And um, and so this is especially challenging when. Uh, you know the the work the work that I do is is not is not just ecology is not just rangeland management. I work in pastoralist systems. That means you have to consider the entire social and institutional system, and you have to work with partners on the ground who are pastoralists and who represent pastoralists. And uh, that's and so taking that social context seriously is is not is not something that everyone is is ready is ready to do. Um, and uh, you know. Another another good example would be uh, I, I collaborate a lot with economists, and we speak very different languages. Uh, although we're all using English, of course, uh, and so um, it's it, it's uh, it's first of all about all getting on the same page, clear communication, uh, making priorities clear, and uh, and and starting off the the research development process or development intervention process. Uh, on, on a good foot. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, Eric, if you don't mind, from what you've heard um, from Jason and Eleanor, are you able to share some reflections or even some of your own thoughts? Thanks. Well, one, one, one thing that I was thinking as Jason was talking there is, is that as, as researchers, but I think actually the research community is maybe not always the one we have to convince of the value of this approach. It's, as he's saying, the, the implementation community. To, to take, take the risk of stepping outside of what they're comfortable with and working with people they don't normally work with. Uh, actually, let me take the example in Kenya here of the national strategy for antimicrobial resistance. And we often use AMR as, a, as an example of this sort of thing, but genuinely it's been... It's been grabbed by, by the horns, as it were, uh, as, an, as an area where health, uh, animal health and environment can collaborate and work together and where the, the genuine value in doing that is, is clear, not only on paper, but, but in the outcome of that joined up approach. Um, so I think uh, it, it's... It's about risk taking to some extent for the, for those communities who aren't necessarily comfortable with stepping outside of their disciplinary expertise. Maybe the funding is difficult. Maybe maybe the culture is just not there to do that. To to look broadly outside of where the work normally gets done and try and be more inclusive with other disciplines. And great things come of that. And I think um, you know AMR is a good example. Here in Kenya, but before AMR, the establishment of the Zoonotic Disease Unit uh, was a, a major bold step by, by government to create those linkages, which had very significant 
um, outcomes in terms of developing policy for disease control, in terms of integrating the way surveillance was being done for a multitude of different, different issues. It did tend to focus on, on zoonoses. It was the zoonotic disease unit after all. But I don't think there's any shame in, in, in that at all. And that they blazed the trail for what's now happening with, with AMR and which will, will potentially happen for other issues too. Thanks. Again, sorry, before I move away, so just to ask, do you believe that um, these establishments that were set up are reevaluating, or have they already started to, to ensure that there is more of an integrated approach? Oh, the, uh, well, in, in the case of uh, those institutional setups in, in, in Kenya, at least, they were established with that integrated approach at the very core of what they do, and they've done that extremely well. Thanks, Eric. Um, back to Nick for a mentee question, please. What challenges do you face in applying One Health approaches? Uh, we'd like to hear from all of you in, um, in the virtual space. All right. Having listened to all of us and how we are playing One Health in our different spaces, it would be nice to hear the challenges that we encounter often in, in our day-to-day -day -day work. So please share your opinions on mentee. Or oh, are there no challenges that you encounter? And how do you handle the challenges, if you can? Yes, yeah, so from what you are seeing, what is coming up is that there is an issue of communication, and not only communication, but also getting the idea across the board between the different sectors, silo mentality by the individual partners in the One Health framework. Some challenges are very specific that they can't work with the medical officers, I don't know why. Competing priorities and interest by the different disciplines. Let's see what you're getting on. Ignorance of the wider picture, I don't know from the individual disciplines or ignorance about what we are pushing across. Technical jargon. I think maybe because of the different disciplines involved, misconception, overstepping, maybe Hector will ask our panelists how, how much they can step in when people are collaborating. There is also the issue of fear of uh, overstepping when people are collaborating. Yeah, funny enough, they say the vets and medics are hard to work, yet often they've said they're the ones who have been taking the One Health approach. They've been at the forefront. Yeah, so generally I think and we can still get on the comments. We are now at 75, but seems communication is the issue here and different disciplines. So keep, keep sending your, in, your inputs, then we can have it to, we can throw it to our panelists. All right, over to you, Etel. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for all of your comments. Um, we'd like to go back to the panel session now. Um, and this time we'd like to hear from uh, Jeanette and then Salome. So Jeanette, starting with you, how do you believe uh, we can bridge some of these gaps and improve transdisciplinary activities? So some of these challenges that we've mentioned in uh, One Health Research, I think they're a mirror of what we see when it comes to implementation of One Health strategies or, wow. or projects in, in the public health sphere. So some of the things that uh, we can do perhaps in research can uh, be a roadmap for like, when the government wants to implement uh, One Health strategies. What's coming out here from the discussion is that we exist in silos and there doesn't seem to be a platform where we can um, uh, collaborate. And even when there is, we'd maybe focus on human and animal, then we forget the environment, or we do human and the environment and then forget the, um, the vectors, forget the animals. But um, what I see is there is a possibility, especially in research institutes and I think universities, because they have the expertise in all of those areas. And so if they were to um, have a platform where you have the medical doctors, you have the vets, you have the ecologists, you have the entomologists, you have the parasitologists, some form or forum, and I guess this conference is one of them, where people can come together and have a shared vision on research. So it's not that when it comes to RVF, the vets are doing their thing, the medical doctors are doing their thing, the social scientists are doing their thing, and it's somehow 
by uh, by luck we are moving in a certain direction but it's not that we ever came together to have a shared vision on what we wanted to understand about rift valley fever so therefore the um, the development of a research platform that allows us mm -hmm. to to col collaborate i think is an important thing um also to break these these issues of, of the silos. Uh, one of the issues we face is funding. So funding for human health may be quite a lot. Uh, animal health will be slightly less, but if you look at the component that somebody could call one health, you'll find that funding for that is much lower. But if we think of one health as an approach, then it wouldn't make sense that, um, you know, a funder would, um, would fund One Health research to such a low extent. So it starts from there. I think uh, um, our advocacy so for what is important, us in the field of One Health research, we have to explain to the policymaker, to the funder, what is the relevance, what is the importance of One Health research so that they see its utility. And I think that also speaks to what uh, Dr. Eleanor was talking about. So there are these systematic reviews that are done there's an animal component, but people don't seem to be interested in it. And perhaps it's in the fault of the researcher in that the research is not geared towards a policy question that the policymaker can, can relate to. So if we have a One Health research that is you know, uh, policy relevant, then perhaps then even when it comes to uh, the review of evidence, people will be calling on uh, One Health research. There's another element that's come out here quite strongly, and it's the fact that we need to be collaborative. I, it seems to be that perhaps in a lot of settings, a One Health researcher or a leader, uh, there are people with, I believe, a certain type of skill set, somebody who can manage to bring different disciplines together. I don't think that's something we assume, we should assume that everybody has the capacity to do. I think it's something that within pre-service training um, is something that we can build on so that um, if you have a One Health outlook, you must know how to engage with people from other disciplines, uh, how to use the information that comes from, from other disciplines. There's also the question here or some of the comments here that have been put up is, you know, um, they feel like sometimes One Health is beyond their expertise. But One Health, you're not required to be an expert in everything. Uh, I don't think that's what the approach is about. But the approach is about um, having an awareness of some of these One Health issues, knowing what your role is, knowing what the role of other people are, uh, and how to you know, refer or to communicate or to call on those additional resources in order to either um, answer a particular problem or answer um, uh, a research um, question. That's it. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, Salome, how do you propose we go about bridging some of these gaps? Um, I would like to share uh, an example from uh, uh, a research that we are currently conducting on gender inclusive vaccine ecosystem. And this brings in different disciplines to try and solve the issue of disease among communities and their livestock. So what, what has been happening is that each component has been going with their own, <clears throat> excuse me, each component has been running with their own component on their own. So for example, the veterinary um, team will go conduct their vet related activities, come back, the social scientists go, come back, and everyone does that. But one occasion made us stop and think, this is not going to work. So, the veterinary team was going to do a vaccination for goats. And when they went, they realized the turnout was very low. And they were wondering, why is the turnout low? And they were, they were noting that there were just women, elderly women bringing the animals. And uh, before they went out for the field work, I had asked them, do, uh, can we accompany you? Can we have one of our members from our team to accompany you to just bring out those gender issues and the social cultural issues? And they said, no, we have incorporated some questions in our, in our questionnaire. But when they started the practice, they realized this is much way beyond what they had put on paper and what they were expecting. And so that evening they called us and said, please come. We need somebody from your team to join us. 
And so once we started working together, we are already seeing that, and, and the same has also happened to us before we've been training on um, gender issues and the sociocultural aspects. Then we realize questions come that involve veterinary related issues or other issues, and we can't answer them. So as a team, we've started working together, kind of gelling, such that when we go for an activity, we are all going together and uh, we have kind of the same vision, but each component is contributing something to the whole, but it's a, it's, it's a complete system, but each person is contributing something to that. So um, what I see is that as, as, as different disciplines, we when we look at One Health, we think One Health is usually, so long as there's somebody doing a, a specific thing, the vet, the health, the ecosystem related issues, we are good to go, that's One Health. But it's more about the gelling. How do we gel all these things together? How do we fuse the expertise from the vet, the expertise from the uh, uh, ecologist, the ecosystem um, um, expert, expertise? How do we incorporate all those aspects so that then what we are bringing out is a holistic solution to improve the well being of not just the humans, but also their animals and their ecosystems? So for me, I see there's the aspect of also looking at best practice. Do we have some of the research where One Health has been well ingrained and the outputs are there for us to show that this can be documented to showcase that this can actually work and that it may not have to cost so much, but if some of those teams or this best practice has been achieved with minimal engagement, because we are now, um, when you go together, you ride on the resources are minimal rather than each team going at different times but you uh, save on the resources. So that again is minimal, but you achieve great outputs. So having best practice, and then also just the key thing is still that coordination, coordinating, collaborating, and communicating across each of the disciplines and looking at it within the wider context. And this is the local context in which we work in. Because if we do not take that into consideration and involve the communities we are working with, then whatever we are doing may not we may not get uptake and adoption in the community. Yeah, so those are my thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. I like the, the, the thinking that it's about a journey and, and fusing all these various expertise together. Um, Jason, can you share some reflections from what you've heard or even share some of your own uh, ideas on some of the challenges you've faced? You know, uh, one, one thing that I've been thinking about just now <clears throat> is timelines uh, and, you know, medical science you 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 give you give a treatment or you stop exposure to a threat and you expect the, the benefit to to be immediate right which it, it generally is the same in, in veterinary science and probably you all could come up with a lot of examples why i'm wrong about that but it's much more technical the the, the results are much more immediate uh when it comes to land management the there's always a, t a big time lag you know, and that could be a relatively short time lag. So if, let's say if we want to talk about carbon sequestration under improved forages. So to take an example from my work, if this is in a humid highland region in Africa, then, you know, within three years, uh, we could measure a, 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 a significant change in the carbon stock uh, as, as a result of planting that, that fodder instead of, uh, instead of an annual crop. Uh, and whereas if I'm in a dry rangeland, if three years is far, is far too short, you know, you're looking more at 10 to 15 years. Uh, and so, uh, especially in uh, the, the 15 being more on the, the drier side, you know, deserts like, like Turkana here in Kenya or the Chalbi Desert, um, you know, very, very dry areas. You simply don't have, you know, a desert means you don't have a lot of rain, right? So things grow slowly, which means carbon is added to the ecosystem slowly, especially the soil. Uh, and so I think uh, realistic expectations about what results you expect and when um, is, is, a really, is a really key element. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to Bring, bring that point up uh, and it's and it's also it's not only that the that the, the timeline is, is longer the, the the gains are are perhaps you know uh, not as guaranteed um, and there's always a risk of backsliding although there's a risk of backsliding in in the case of any action uh, and 
and it involves a lot more all of these integrative factors especially at places as complicated as as pastoralist rangelands of of course but you know you could say a lot of the same things about uh you know human grasslands uh, here here in the highlands for example and um there's still there's still a lot of other factors that come that come into play there uh, in terms of the the actual land management if you're going to improve the 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 or shall we, shall we, you know improve the environmental benefits to public health or reduce the downsides of environmental conditions to public health that's it, it's it's going to it's going to take longer than administering a vaccine or you know something that's faster like that and i'm not reducing all veterinary science or medical science to vaccines obviously but uh, i think everyone can see the the value in that example it's a lot more complicated when it comes to the ecosystem thanks Jason, thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists for that um, really comprehensive um, discussion. Uh, what we'd like to do now, because we have a few minutes, is, is try and take some of the questions that have come through in the chat box. And um, feel free to put your hand up or jump in to our panelists who wants to answer that. Uh, we have a question that said health veterinary services and environmental health services are devolved functions here in Kenya. So are there any thoughts on how to spur discussions and engagements with county governments whilst, while, while aware cognizant of completing, competing needs? Don't jump at once. So is uh, Dr. Muturi still in the room? Uh, that would be, I think it would be really good to uh, lead on that because um, my feeling is that if you want something to be done, you have to provide a platform for people to move in that direction. So the same way we thought there should be, you know, um, when it comes to diseases, we need to have uh, an approach that looks at both human and animal health. And then there was a zoonotic disease unit that was developed, somebody would argue then, is this reflected all the way to the county level, such that when you respond to outbreaks or there's an issue, you have both the, the, the medical doctor and the vet responding to it. And then if we want to incorporate the environment, I think the first one, because ZDU was leading the way in this, in ZDU, do they have uh, an environmental health person on board? Uh, and if they do, what has their experience been? Because I think that would be interesting to see how it could be replicated in the counties. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, we had a question on Menti that said, uh, is One Health sampling each domain or is it more? And if it is more than just ensuring that you've sampled from each of the domain, then what is it? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mark Nanyingi. I just wanted to jump in on the on the the ZDU's role and the establishment of the county one health unit. So, in the recently developed one health strategic plan, what we are proposing is uh, what we call the county one health units. And this initially had been piloted by the CDC about uh, 2015, uh, but then with support from other partners. Um, we are having an opportunity to uh, learn from what the Kenya Red, Red Cross has done in about nine counties in the country with their CP3 project. Uh, and then what we have developed, of course, we're supporting the ZDU is a county one health curriculum, which actually trains people at the county level using standard one health approaches, but at the same time, actually trying to borrow governance that is at the top level of the ZDU to replicate what is happening at the national level and try to see on how we can integrate this at the county one health uh, st st steering committee. Some counties have gone further and developed their one health policies, uh, but then we see this uh, sort of an approach that can gain more momentum from the county level and coming upwards so that we might have a one health policy that has a, a governance fr framework, uh, which looks at the coordination actually coming all the way from the top to the developed units. So that's what we are, I think I'll be talking uh, in, the, in the last day in one of my presentations. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much. We look forward to, to hearing a little bit more on that, um, which brings me to the question that we were asking earlier um, in the Menti, which was, is One Health just sampling each of the systems or is it more than that? And if it is, then what does that entail? 
y yes, I mean, it, it's not even sampling in each of the domains. I think uh, if we're talking about research, we, we sometimes sample, sometimes we collect other types of, of data, metadata about the about the individuals, about the environment in which we're working. And One Health might simply be collecting the right additional data to go with your sample from an animal. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to also sample from the human and also take a soil sample and a leaf sample and an air sample. It, it, it definitely it, it means putting what you're doing in the context of everything else, not necessarily trying to collect something from everything else all of the time. If, if that's what we were doing, it would be an endless circle and it would never end. And we'd, we would end up with so much data, it would be very hard also to understand how those different, different data are linked to each other. But it's about context. If I'm collecting this, how do, do these other things that are, exist in the universe where this thing that I'm collecting comes from, how do those things influence the result that I find? And, and that's why it's an approach rather than a discipline, because we, we have to conceptualize what we're doing in a broader context without trying to do everything all at once, because if we do that, we'll be nowhere. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Um, we have another question saying collaborative approaches need time, energy and long term commitment. How can institutions and funders better support One Health approaches? Eleanor, would you like to take that? That's a challenging question, Hector. <laughs> uh, quite challenging. Um, so um, collaboration, um, it has even been put a lot on the on Menti that collaboration is a challenge. The silo culture is a challenge in many institutions. And I know I've been in, I've been in many forums in evidence-based decision-making where again, the same issue of silo, um, silo mentality is constantly raised, constantly raised. So I think it's just making small steps, searching first by collaborative research. Uh, and in, for example, I just am biased towards the work I do uh, when it comes to decision-making, um, making sure that uh, those at the panel um, uh, cut across different um, sectors and areas. So that really helps. Uh, for example, I've been involved in other projects where panelists were very diverse. Um, so that really helped in just contextualizing um, the work and the collaborative effort was really amazing. And it was very interesting how uh, the, you know, the views of this group are so different, but yet everything was extremely important. So uh, uh, institutions and groups have to be intentional uh, they should not sit back and wait for it to happen organically. Many people talk about it and hope that it will happen organically. So it, uh, people have to be intentional for, from researchers, even from funders and funding calls, being intentional on that type of research. Um, and not to say that nothing is being done. I know I've come across some funding calls where the funders have stressed for this particular call, we expect a transdisciplinary approach. So the teams that were successful are those that were successful at presenting a transdisciplinary team and approach. So not just about the team, but the approach and the skill set that the team was bringing to the table. So that's all I can say about that, but it's a very difficult question to answer. Eleanor, thank you so much for trying. Appreciate that. Um, so we'd like to close by just sort of saying that, yes, it's a challenge. We've heard about the challenge. You have shared all the challenges as well. Uh, but if we continue to keep going at it, as uh, Salome pointed out, this is about the journey. Um, and hopefully through training and effective communication, we'll all be able to be better One Health advocates. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for participating. Thank you very much. Um, and over to Nick for another mentee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector, the panelists, and also our attendees for that. So we'll have our final question, our final mentee discussion, where we'd want to hear how the one thing that you do differently after listening to all the talks, the panel discussions, and all the emerging thoughts from, from this, either in collaboration, funding, communication, 
and from all the insights that we've had today, how the one thing, only one thing that you do differently in while conducting your One Health research. Yes, somebody says they'll approach it dif differently. They'll promote more teamwork, avoid the silo thinking, they'll consult with other disciplines, communicate effectively. Somebody says they'll speak more about the environment. Jason, are they resonating with your thoughts? They'll speak more about, while doing One Health, they'll speak more about the environment sector. They'll involve the community, very important, like we saw for the NAROC study. Collaborate and collaborate more. Undertake joint interventions. Yes, that's very good. Not just do an intervention and walk away. Some will champion for One Health. Yes, yeah, so generally we are getting... You're getting a feel that people will now communicate more, collaborate more, engage with each other, com and communicate better. So, and I think to our session leads, I think this was one of the outcomes that they were looking for. So I'd welcome Dr. Lian and Dr. Thumbi to close. Karibu. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think we've come to the end of a, a really exciting day and there's certainly been a lot of um, things for us to take away and think about. Um, one is that we're on a journey that we can do things better and we need to communicate, communicate and collaborate. Um, and I hope that this, uh, this conference and this forum has been one of the ways in which we um, start to, to do that. Thumbi, is there any reflection from you? Uh, I think the first one is just to appreciate that we have had more than 300 at any single time people attending these, these sessions, which I think is fantastic given, um, you know, the, our current status. So I think we are really taking advantage of the online, um, online opportunity. The, the talks have been fantastic, uh, and I really enjoyed the discussions that, you know, coming from the panelists this, this afternoon. And I think one, one nice thing I noted is I don't think any of the panelists is a vet, which is finally people who are not necessarily vets, you know, so embracing, <laughs> which is great. Excellent. Yes, we, I think um, despite the, the times of pandemics and COVID, we've certainly shown today that we can have an interesting and stimulating discussion with a lot of participants online. And we really thank everybody who's been able to join, give their valuable time to being here in person or being online. Um, and to all our esteemed panelists, speakers, those who provided these really wonderful flash talks, anyone who wants to catch up, go back over presentations, please um, keep an eye on our website. The recordings will be made available there towards the end of the week. Keep uh, engaged with the conversation through Twitter and um, we very much look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow um, for our, our next discussions where we're going to deep dive on um, mainstreaming gender in One Health and looking at our capacity strengthening um, requirements.